Well, I'm eager to look together into God's Word with you this morning. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. We come to the final message in this short series on the full armor of God as we've been working our way through this remarkable section of Scripture that is a call to arms to every true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a reminder that the Christian life is lived on a battlefield and that we are soldiers of the cross. We have been enlisted by the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth to be in His army, and we must have on the full armor of God. And we have been marked out by a great foe, by a great enemy, Satan himself, who has at his disposal untold numbers of demon spirits. And that is the reality of the Christian life in which we find ourselves. And today we come to the last piece of the armor that needs to be put on, which is the sword of the Spirit. The title of this message is very simply, The Sword of the Spirit. I want to read this larger section beginning where we began this series in verse 10. But our focus today will be the end of verse 17. But one last time now, let us walk through this text. Beginning in verse 10, finally, Paul writes, Be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of His might, put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And it would be naive and delusional on our part for us to think it would be anything but this. This is what we're up against. So, verse 13, Therefore... Take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation. And now here's where we are today. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the only offensive weapon that the Roman soldier would carry into battle, the sword. And no army can remain on the defensive and expect to win any battle. There must be an offensive threat which the soldiers would mount if they are to defeat their enemy. All defense and no offense means no victory. A soldier must have a sword, and he must wield it if he is to be on the offensive and to have the victory. A soldier without a sword is a soldier without any chance of victory. If all an army does is resist the attacks of the enemy, he can never defeat the enemy. All offense and all defense and no offense only postpones ultimate defeat. Any soldier who aspires to victory must go on the offensive. And this necessitates having a sword. Every other piece of the armor is defensive. This piece alone is to be used aggressively and on the offense. This is why Paul now concludes with the sword of the Spirit. Everything has led up to this final piece of the armor. Everything to this point has been defensive, as we have already said. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. All these have been to protect against the onslaught of the the enemy 
But now, finally, the sixth and final piece, here is the final key for victory. All of these pieces are very important. Someone came up to me after last week's sermon and said, well, Pastor, each week you say that this is the most important piece of the armor. To be very correct, I've never said each, any one piece is more important than another. I've said each piece is vitally important. This piece must be in your life. This piece must be in your hand. This piece of the armor, you must wield it or you will be living a defeated Christian life. The devil will be pushing you around and you will be in reverse and you will be beaten down in your Christian life. So let me ask you, are you tired of being discouraged? Are you weary of being downcast? Are you finally exhausted of being defeated in your battle against sin? Are you longing to be victorious in the Christian life? If these questions describe your life, then this message from this text is for you. The reality is this is for every one of us here today. As we consider the sword of the Spirit, there is so much to say. I want you to notice this under three headings. You'll recognize these three headings. These are the same three headings. Number one, the historical background. Number two, the spiritual significance. Number three, the personal application. Regardless of what heading we put on those three homiletical points, those three issues must be addressed to understand what this means and how this relates to my life. And number one, the historical background. Before we can even understand what Paul is saying to me about my Christian life, we must go back 2,000 years in our understanding of this imagery. In ancient times, there were two kinds of swords. First, there was the broad sword. And we've already talked about it because it was because of the broad sword, this three to four foot long, massive sword that the soldiers had to wear the helmet to, to deflect the, the broadsword. Uh, the broadsword was intended to cut someone's head off. And there was a second sword, and that was the short sword. It was like a dagger. It was like a, a butcher knife, if you will. It was anywhere from six inches long to as much as, as two feet, probably more six to 18 inches in length, and that is the word that is used here. Uh, this sword was used not in a, in a broad general way to make wild swings to try to lop off someone's head that would take a, a great back swing and require a, an extended follow-through. No, this sword was used in close hand-to-hand -hand combat when the enemy is immediately in front of you and it would be pulled out and quickly and suddenly inserted into the rib cage or into the lungs of the soldier in front of you, and it brought immediate death. It, it was a, a fatal uh, incision that would be made. Uh, this word for sword was used in the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was done a couple of centuries before the coming of Christ. It was used to describe the flint knife used in circumcision in Joshua chapter 5. And it was used of a, of a barber's razor to cut someone's beard in Ezekiel chapter 5. I think you see the picture of what it is. It was carried in a sheath or in a scabbard that was attached to a soldier's belt. And it was carried on the right side because most soldiers were right-handed. And on the left side, there was the shield. On the right side was this dagger-like knife, which was this sword. It was about two inches wide and about as much as two feet long, as I've already said, and his purpose was for stabbing and penetrating 
and to strike at the vital organ of the enemy. This sword was always at hand and ready for use in battle. Every other piece of the armor, as we have already said, was to deflect, was to repel the advancements of the enemy, but the Roman soldier had to have this dagger-like sword in order to put to death his, his enemy. Because of its small size, it had to be used with precision, with accuracy, with skill. It, it could not be used with, with wild uh, effort like the broadsword could. No, this little dagger had to hit a specific point, a, a chink in the armor, a, a small opening that this sword could be inserted. And just one insertion of this sword into the side of an opposing uh, foe meant instant death. There was virtually no recovery for any soldier who suffered such a, a stabbing. So you needed to have this sword as you went into battle. If all you did was just put up resistance but were never able to kill your enemy, it's just a matter of time until you yourself would become a casualty of war. That is the historical background. And that is worth our noting in order to understand the spiritual significance. So we come now second to the spiritual significance. And we would ask, how does this sword relate to our Christian lives? Maybe you're asking yourself this morning. Maybe you're saying, I've never been in the military. I've, I've never been drafted. I've never served. Uh, I've never been in war. I've never been in battle. What is the connection of this? And, and at that, this was 2,000 years ago. What is the present day spiritual significance in my Christian life? A very fair and valid question. Well, let's look at this in, in verse 17. Set it before your eyes again. And the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit here means the sword that comes from the Spirit. It is not saying that the Spirit is the sword. It is saying that the Spirit gives the sword. The Spirit provides the sword. Metaphorically, the Spirit places this sword into our hands. The sword of the Spirit. Now, this is to say the Spirit is the source of this sword. He is the giver of this sword. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to put this sword into our hands. Now, what is this sword? Well, we continue to read in verse 17, which is the word of God. The sword that the Spirit provides is the word of God. And please note the inseparability of the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives with the word of God, with the word of God. The Spirit never works independent of the Word of God. What God the Spirit is doing in this world at any given place is always in conjunction with the ministry of the Word of God. Those two will never be separated. And to separate those two, you go off into charismatic confusion, you go off into mysticism and all kinds of really religious superstition. The Word of God and the Spirit of God always work hand in hand together because the Spirit of God is the author of the Word of God. The Spirit of God is the giver of the Word of God. Now, when he says the Word of God, the word for word is not the normal word that we might anticipate that it would be. It is not logos. That might be one of the Greek words with which you are somewhat familiar. Many Christian bookstores would have their name as Logos Bookstore. And Logos 
refers to the written word of God. It refers to the entirety of the written word of God. But this is a different word. This is the, uh, a Greek word, rhema, which refers to a specific truth within the larger written word. It, it is not independent of the written word. It comes out of the written word. It is a specific portion of the written word. It, it means synonymously uh, a statement out of the written word, a specific text of Scripture, a specific passage of Scripture. The Word of God here refers to an individual truth out of the written Word of God. The Spirit of God is the author of the written Word of the Logos, and it is the Spirit of God who works in our hearts to bring to the forefront of our minds and our hearts as we find ourselves in the day of battle. It is the Holy Spirit who then draws out of the written word just the specific portion that we need at that moment when we come under attack by the devil in order to resist temptation or in order to go on the offensive and to rescue lost souls who are held captive by the devil. Now, the Spirit supplies the sword of the Word in a threefold sense. Number one, the Spirit is the author of all Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God. Theonoustos, God breathed. And this means that the Scripture is given to us by the authorship of the Holy Spirit. The second way, or the second sense in which the Spirit supplies the sword is the Spirit enables us to understand the Word. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The things of the Spirit are spiritually appraised. In other words, the Spirit enables us to interpret the Word and to understand its meaning. Psalm 119, verse 18, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous truths, from your word. It is the Spirit of God who must open our eyes. He is the Spirit of truth, and He is the resident truth teacher within each one of us. But the third way in which the Spirit supplies the sword of the Word of God is He enables us to use the Word properly. It is one thing to know the contents of this book. It is something else entirely to know how to use it, to get it out of our head and into our hands, and to use it to resist temptation by the devil, to use it to go into Satan's strongholds and to bear witness of the gospel and seek the rescue and the release of those who are in bondage to the devil. The Spirit must give us just the right portion out of Scripture to use in just the right setting. It is this third and final sense that the Apostle Paul intends here. When he says the sword of the Spirit, he does not mean that the Spirit is the author of Holy Scripture, though he is. And his reference is not that the Spirit enables us to understand the Word of God, not here, though he does in other verses. The intent here is that as we find ourselves in specific situations, as we live our Christian lives, that it is the Holy Spirit who draws upon what we have learned and what we have read and what we have studied and brings it to the forefront of our mind and of our heart and impresses us, say this, bear witness of this. And so many times as we are living our Christian lives, the, we suddenly think of just the right verse to say to just the right person in just the right setting, and that is the operation of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. He, that is the Holy Spirit putting the sword into our hands that we may be most effective. Now, 
as we consider our use of this sword of the Spirit, it is to be used in a twofold way. Just continue to think with me. It is to be used both defensively and it is to be used offensively. Those are simple enough categories. Martin Lloyd Jones writes in his sermon on this particular text, he says, the sword serves a dual purpose, defensive and offensive. It is something whereby we can not only repel the enemy, that's the defense, but also attack the enemy, that's the offense. We have not merely to repel or to resist the enemy and his nefarious attacks in a negative sense, but that there is also to be a positive element. He, the devil, is to be caused to retreat. We are to drive the devil back. I would remind us all that James 4 verse 7 says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And there is to be this defensive and offensive use of the sword of the Spirit. Well, let's consider first the defensive. This is still under the spiritual significance. Now, let's consider the defensive use of the sword of the Spirit. We've said that it's the only offensive piece of the weaponry, but it does also have a defensive use, and that defensive use is to repel temptations that Satan hurls at us. In James 4, 7 that I just quoted, resist the devil and he will free, flee from you. Question, how do we resist the devil? Do we just say, devil be gone? No. We resist the devil by using the sword of the Spirit and it is a superior weapon. Not only is greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world, but greater is that which is in our hand than he who is in the world. And we see this carried out so perfectly in the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Now, we've already covered this in our uh, short series, so there's no need for us to, to retrack all the drama of Matthew 4 and Luke 4. But just to remind you of a few basics, with each temptation that was thrown at the Lord Jesus Christ, how did Jesus respond? Jesus responded every time, it is written. How do you think we should respond? It is written. And to say it is written means far more than just quoting a verse. It means clinging to that verse. It means conforming to that verse. It, it means trusting in that verse. It means obeying that verse. It's not just a, a magical formula to, to throw out there. But it must be the reality of our life at that particular moment in time. Now, when we read Luke 4, 1 and 2, it says that Jesus was filled with the Spirit... He was led by the Spirit. He was a Spirit-filled man in his sinless humanity. He was baptized by the Holy Spirit in the River Jordan to empower him as he began his public ministry. And so Jesus, filled with the Spirit in the wilderness, came under the attack of Satan. That attack was in the form of seductions enticements, lures, temptations, deceptions. Jesus was filled with the Spirit. And with each temptation, it is right to assume that it was the Holy Spirit who was filling, controlling, and empowering Jesus who put just the right sword into his hand to resist just that particular temptation with which he was being confronted. The first temptation that we have recorded is, the devil said, if you are the Son of God, cause these stones to become bread. It would not have been effective to have quoted John 3.16. 
it would not have been effective just to quote some random verse out of left field. No, there needed to be a, a specific resistance to the specific temptation with a specific text of Scripture. And Jesus, who had mastered the Word of God, Jesus now quotes Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. That's pretty good. And he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And with that, he puts up the resistance by the authority of the Word of God and takes his stand on the Word of God. The devil then comes back with a second temptation, takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple, and he says, Jump! Jesus record, re, re, responds by quoting from the Psalms. You shall not put the Lord your God to a foolish test. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, that response would have been ineffective in response to if you are the Son of God. No, that text matches up with that temptation and gave Jesus the victory within his humanity. And then the final temptation, taking him up to the tall mountain and causing the kingdoms of this world to be paraded before him and said, if you will bow down and worship me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus was a chapter and verse man. Jesus quoted again from Deuteronomy and said, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. By this example, we see how Jesus resisted temptation. It wasn't just sheer willpower. It, it wasn't just walking away. Those temptations will follow you wherever you walk away. No, it was by unsheathing the sword of the Spirit and the Spirit of God who led Jesus into the wilderness, the Spirit of God who filled Jesus while he was in the wilderness, is the same Spirit of God who put into his hands just the right text of Scripture. So it is in our lives. It is the Holy Spirit who must supply to our minds and to our hearts just the appropriate text of Scripture to confront a specific temptation fired by Satan at us. It is critically important that we know the Word of God. Is that not true? Now, there must be a full war chest of verses that we have at our disposal from which the Holy Spirit will draw and put into our hands. And so, for example, when the, the next time the devil comes and attacks you and says, you know, God's just not good to you. God's holding out on you. Look at everybody else. God, their marriage, their house, their car, their education, their whatever. God must love them more than he loves you. Look at you. Look at all that you're going through. And tries to beat us down into thinking that God is not good. And by the way, that's exactly what he did with Eve in the Garden of Eden. They lived in paradise in the devil gained a wedge into their hearts and said, there's one little tree over here you can't eat from, but the whole universe is yours. And they bought into the lie that God is not good. God was so good, he wouldn't let them eat from that tree. How we need the Word of God to be able to, to respond and say, from, for example, Psalm 84, verses 10 and 11, the Lord thy God is a sun and a shield. He gives grace and mercy, and no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Or Psalm 37, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Now the Holy Spirit of God must put into our hand the sword of the Spirit, the sword which the Spirit gives in order to resist the devil. Or the devil's attack may attack us with discouragement and despair and despondency. And there's just a little cloud that follows over your head wherever you go. And it's the devil's cloud. And he would seek just to keep the sun from shining into your life. 
and how we need to be able to respond with a text something like, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God, who are called according to His purpose, every moment of every day, God is awake and alert on the throne, and He is moving heaven and earth and causing all things providentially to work for our good and for His glory. We may not see the big picture, but God does, and with infinite wisdom and, and eternal love is working on our behalf, even through adversity and difficulty. We must have the sword which only the Spirit can put into our hands. And that sword is nothing else but the Word of God. He's not going to put a magazine into your hand. He, he's not going to put a, a poem into your hand. He's not going to put something else into your hand. He will put the Word of the living God into your hand. And everything else, you might as well be picking up plastic forks to try to resist the devil. They're just going to shatter into a million pieces. And there is only one sword that has sovereign authority to resist the devil, and that is the written word of the living God. And what the Spirit pulls out of that written word and puts into our hearts and puts into our minds at just that time. That's the defensive. And you need to be on the defensive. Second, the offensive. Now, I want to say again, if you're only on the defense, you're never going to win a ball game. Just a or a battle. Just a matter of time till you lose. You're just holding off the inevitable if you're never on the offensive. And to use this on the offensive is to advance into Satan's strongholds and to use the Word of God to rescue those who are imprisoned by Satan. It is to launch an aggressive attack on the kingdom of darkness by using the sword of the Spirit to reach lost souls who are held captive by Satan to do his will. And there is nothing else that will deliver them from the kingdom of darkness except the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When we use the Word of God with those who are lost, it is only the sword of the Spirit that will do several things. It is only the sword of the Spirit that convicts. No one will ever be converted until they are first convicted of their sin and of their condemnation and of their dire and desperate need for redemption. No one ever bypasses conviction and goes straight ahead to conversion. And it is only the sword of the Spirit that cuts to the heart and stabs the conscience and brings about a heart wound of conviction of sin. We read this in Acts 2, verse 37, on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached that incredible gospel sermon of Christ and Him crucified. We read... When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. The word pierced means to, to be stabbed as with a knife, to be wounded. It is the sword of the Spirit that cuts to the core of a person's being and reveals and exposes their sin to themselves and confronts them with their own guilt before a holy God. Hebrews 4, verse 12 is probably the classic cross-reference at this point, which says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper. Did you hear that? Sharper than any two-edged sword. And piercing, that's what a sword does. 
it, it's to pierce, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No one is ever saved until their thoughts and intentions have been judged by God. It is a blessed judgment. It is a blessed conviction. It is a blessed heart wound because it drives them to the emergency room where they receive grace and mercy from a Savior who is mighty to save. The sword wounds very deeply and makes a person bleed with conviction. A military sword pierces the body, but the sword of the Spirit pierces the heart. When you were saved, you received a heart wound. And there is no other way to pass through the narrow gate but that you are suffering under a heart wound. But second, it also converts. The surgeon's scalpel cuts in order that there would be a healing. The surgeon doesn't cut in order for there to be a death. He makes the incision so that good may come to the one who is, who is operated upon. And so it is with this sword of the Spirit. After the heart is cut open by the sword of the Spirit, this same sword must convert the heart. You see, only this sword of the Spirit can perform a heart transplant. Everything else is just Band-Aids. Everything else is just an aspirin tablet. Everything else is just a, a temporal, feel-good fix. There is only one way for there to be a heart transplant, and that is for this sword of the Spirit to pierce and to penetrate the, the cavity of the, of the chest and to make the incision and to go down deep and for that heart of stone to be removed and for a heart of flesh to be put in and for the Holy Spirit of God to be uh, indwelt within that person. Only the sword of the Spirit can bring about such a heart transplant. 1 Peter 1, 23, you have been born again through the living and enduring Word of God. It is the conviction that converts. And then third, it cleanses. Only the Word can cleanse a filthy, stinking, wicked, corrupt, depraved, vile heart from the pollution of sin. John 15, 3, Jesus said, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 26, Christ, having cleansed the church by the washing of water with the word. Nothing cleanses like this sword of the Spirit. Nothing makes the sinner whole and new like the ministry of the Word of God. And so we must use the Word of God like this. We must go to people who need the Lord. We must go to lost sheep who are, who are wandering in the wilderness. We must go to our family members. We must go to our neighbors. We must go to those with whom we work. And as we go, we must unsheath the sword for their good. And we must insert it like a dagger to bring about conviction of sin. And, and that's where so many feel-good churches never have true evangelism. Why they just remain a congregation of unconverted people. Because they do everything they possibly can in the service to remove any element of conviction of sin. It's just to tickle ears, slap backs, stroke egos, grease palms. That's all it's about. And therefore, no one is really converted because there's no real conviction of sin. 
But we are to take the word of God and to use it in such an aggressive manner and to go on the offense. And therefore, we must hold to the truth of the word of God. We, we cannot compromise what the word of God says. We speak of heaven, but we speak of hell. We speak of salvation. We must speak of damnation. We must speak it all. Why would you need to be saved? You need to be saved from the wrath to come. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, It is clear from our text, and his text was this text. He preached this the last year before he died. He said, It is clear from our text that our defense and our conquest must be obtained by sheer fighting. Many try compromise, meaning toning down what the Word of God says. Many try compromise, but if you are a true Christian, you can never do this business well. The adversary is the father of lies, Spurgeon said, and those who are with him understand the art of equivocation. But saints abhor equivocation. We have no order from our commander to patch up a truce and get as good terms as we can in the negotiation. We are not sent by our commander-in-chief to offer concessions. We are to pull out the sword of the Spirit and to go for the juggler. That they may be saved. And may come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Everyone who comes through the narrow gate comes dripping blood from their stabbed conscience that they might seek relief in the arms of an all-forgiving, all-pardoning Savior who is mighty to save and heals every wounded heart that comes to Him. Finally, the personal application. I see my friend, the clock, and I see you, and I need to let you out. I'm going to tell you four things and not even comment on it. The personal application is you need to be armed. Second, you need to be alert. If you don't think that the devil is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You're living in never-never land. Third, be aggressive. You need to resist. You need to repel. You need to thwart. And fourth, you need to be advancing. Don't just hold your ground. You need to be intentionally advancing into the world of darkness with the sword of the Spirit drawn high, that you might rescue those who are held captive by Satan to do his will. I'll give Martin Luther the last word. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, one little word shall fell him. You've got more than a little word. You've got a big word. May the Holy Spirit specific truths into your hands and may you wield it and bring about conviction and conversion and cleansing.